Hello and welcome to After Office Hours, presented by the Hillsdale Collegian. After Office Hours is a show where we discuss interesting and prevalent topics with Hillsdale faculty and professors. I'm Shadrach Straley, and today I'm here with physics professor Dr. Kenneth Hayes. Thank you very much for joining us today. It's my pleasure. start off with talking about the introduction of the new Physics 101 core class. Can you tell us about the process that you went through to develop it and perhaps some major challenges that you saw along the way? Certainly, I'd be happy to. Um, we knew that this course would be uh, added to the um, new core all well, five or six years ago. And so we started to uh, try to understand um, our student understanding of science, but the students who were not science students, but the majority of students who'd be taking this core course, and to learn about their attitudes towards science. And so we started uh, surveying the Science 101 students, the old core course that came before Physics 100 uh, in 2010. And the, our survey was started off with just four open-ended questions. The students could pretty much respond um, however they wished, and then they went through an evolutionary process which eventually converged to a multiple choice survey of about uh, 40 questions. And so we learned um, about what the student understanding of science was and uh, what their attitudes towards science are. And then we um, started a, a process in developing the course that happened mostly in the last couple years, um, and then last summer, we met many times last summer, for a total of about 200 hours, the mm -hmm. physics department meant about 200 hours. Um, and we worked out the content of the course. Um, unlike the biology department where the different faculty members who are teaching the biology core course uh, can have a lot of control over the content of their individual sections, our sections are pretty much identical. Uh, amongst each of the physics faculty, but we all worked together to create those. So we split the responsibilities for um, the individual lectures amongst the different faculty, and then the, and then we shared our um, production with each other, so that uh, we have a pretty common presentation. Um, it was a very interesting experience for the physics department, um, in that we. We developed a consensus, but only through many hours of discussion, where people would present their ideas and we discuss them until we reached a, a reasonable consensus. And I think the department is pretty happy with the product, and this is the second semester that, that we've been teaching it. So we decided to focus primarily on teaching physics through astronomy concepts because we learned in uh, Science 101 that. There's an innate student curiosity in astronomical topics. Um, and astronomy is really physics, but just applied out beyond the borders of the, of the Earth. And I think uh, that's been confirmed that we've uh, been able to keep student interest throughout the um, content of the course. We also um, tried very hard to address our understanding of students' concerns about science when they started. And we had two primary role, uh, rules for the course. One of them was that um, whatever we present, it would have to be engaging to the great majority of the students. Um, and then the second role was that if ever we presented a topic that was a red flag, we would never not discuss the red flag. That is, we would not take an attitude such as, we know a lot of students are going to have issues with this topic. Uh, we'll just blow through those issues and just present the topic and they can take it or leave it. We decided that that wasn't a productive way to do that. And mm -hmm. Every time we present a topic that we thought the students might have an issue with, um, we would discuss that. We also decided to try to motivate the students towards learning about science um, directly. Um, and so we start off with a few lectures whose entire goal is just to motivate the students to pay attention to, to what's coming next. And the first lecture was on wonder. Since it's easy 
to feel wonder about the universe if you explore it. If you look out into the night sky and you're amazed by the stars, you're amazed by the planets, or amazed by the moon rising, whatever it is that, that grabs your interest, our, our primary goal is to increase the student's sense of wonder for the universe and their sense of wonder in themselves as mm -hmm. the most complex thing in the universe of which we are aware. So uh, that's kind of how the, the general design of it went. So with that in mind, you know, you're, you're talking about these red flag issues, you know, having that conflict. I've seen from personal experience, and I'm sure that you've seen it on the front lines, that Hillsdale offers some interesting conflicts, you know, something that you wouldn't see on other campuses, a concept of the age of the earth or global warming, things that have a consensus in most other campuses, institutions that kind of butt heads here at Hillsdale College. How do you feel your role is in this, in this conflict, in this, in this clash of ideas? Um, you know, how do you take a step back and realize, as a professor, you know, your responsibility to teach about these issues? Um, I've come to understand through many years of dealing um, with science topics that um, a lot of students have, have conflicts with. Um, that yeah, you have to understand that the students have their views for a reason. Mm -hmm. And if you don't try to hear that reason and respect or those reasons, that they're not going to pay attention to what you're trying to tell them. You have to um, be listening. You have to try not to be threatening. You have to be understanding. Um, and you have to understand that usually emotion and ideology will trump reason mm -hmm. and fact. And so build trust. So one of the goals with a uh, with new course is to, is the reason we address red flag issues as red flag issues is we want to have the students have trust in us. Mm -hmm. And we, we purposely try to stay away from red flag issues for a while so that trust can develop. Mm -hmm. And then you listen carefully to what they're telling you. And um, what I've understood is if you can keep the emotion out of it and you can have some time to build that trust, the Hillsdale College students are, are very willing to hear. Mm -hmm. For example, in this survey, one of the questions that, um, well, we have a couple of questions and they're exploring the student understanding of anthropogenic climate change. And the great majority of Hillsdale College students, when they start um, the core uh, physics course, um, deny anthropogenic climate change. The numbers around uh, the low 80s percent, like 83%, 85%. Percent. And by the time um, we've explained the physics, and we explain the physics in terms of what determines planetary temperatures. Mm -hmm. It's a physics question, what determines the Earth's temperature, and it doesn't just apply to the Earth, it applies to all the objects in the universe, particularly the objects in the solar system, particularly the other planets. And since the the main area of the course is astronomy, and we're studying not only the solar system, but the galaxy and the structure of matter in the universe at large scales. We do spend some time on the solar system, and the sun is, is the energy source. It's the heart of the solar system, and it's the sun that determines the temperature of the planets. And we can talk about the physics that determines that. And after you've explained the physics, and then you've explained the data that show what's happening both to the atmosphere and the Earth, the increase in greenhouse gases in the Earth's atmosphere, and the overwhelming evidence for the increase in the um, Earth's temperature, the students understand that. And, and we've been very successful overcoming their initial resistance to the mm -hmm. idea of methogenic climate change. As an educator, um, do you you know, is that is that rewarding to you in any way? You know, kind of having the ability to 
you know, be a part of the dialogue in somebody's life like that. Oh, it's tremendously rewarding. I mean, mm -hmm. that's the whole reason for being here, right? Is to mm -hmm. share what you love. Yeah. I mean, obviously, if you're not successful in sharing what you love, it's frustrating. Yeah. But if you if you learn how to do it, and you have rewarding experiences where you see that if you if you understand what drives students and you understand how to engage them mm -hmm. and keep them interested and then convey to them the in information that you wish to convey to them and have them receive it and understand it, nothing beats that. You know, you talked briefly about the character of a Hillsdale student. Right. And I just want to know if, there, if there's anything that you've seen specifically or, or how you would characterize the Hillsdale student when it comes to um, the issues of, of science or those even in the science department. Is there anything that you've noticed about them in comparison to other places that you've taught or other experiences that you've had? Um, well, the science students, the students who choose to major in science, like the physics students, and we did a lot with the chemistry students in terms of them taking you know, required year physics. Mm -hmm. um, they're com very committed to science and they're hardworking and they understand the effort that's required. And, um, and the non-science students, uh, as I mentioned briefly earlier, I think, they, they haven't had much exposure to science. Mm -hmm. The great majority of, of the non-science Hillsdale students um, in this survey we try to measure how much exposure, prior exposure to science that they had and we measure it in terms of what they read, um, what they uh, use on the web, what they watch in terms of uh, documentaries and so on, mm -hmm. and they've had very little exposure to science. But they also have, um, have been taught, the, ma the majority of them, um, to fear science. Mm -hmm. um, for example, we asked them a question, um, current theories in science are against one or more of my most deeply held beliefs, mm -hmm. and about 60% of the students respond, they have three choices, yes, no, and it's not an issue for me. And about 60% of them respond, yes. 60% mm -hmm. respond that current theories in science are against one or more of my most deeply held beliefs. And 12% respond no. So that's five to one, mm -hmm. yes to no. And then the rest respond, it's not an issue to me, which is a little less than 30%. Um, I think if you went to a large research university, you wouldn't get a response to a question like that. You wouldn't get the same response. And so I think it's very important to be aware of that yeah. and then to, to deal with it, mm -hmm. to, to address it. And what I find is that if you're willing to understand how it is that the students got that view towards science and then try to show them a different reality that they're that they're open to it. Mm -hmm. You know, and I I think that's a very interesting, you know, kind of dichotomy that you have. You know, you talk about how rewarding it is, and I want to talk specifically about those who've you know been committed to the science program. Do we have any people from the physics department specifically who've gone on to do anything in the field? Um, do we have any alumni who've done anything um, that you would consider? Notable. Oh, well, certainly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've had um, various alumni who've gone on to become professors. Mm -hmm. um, for example, one of the more famous of the Hillsdale uh, graduates in physics is a guy named Coleman Miller, mm -hmm. who uh, graduated in the 1980s from Hillsdale College. And when he graduated, he was the youngest um, person to graduate from a four year institution in the United States with a, a perfect A average. He went on to Caltech, and then he's now a professor of astronomy at um, Maryland, University of Maryland. Mm -hmm. um, we had a, a, a female graduate in the 90s, Erin Dupree, who also went into academics and is teaching. Um, we are very good at getting students into graduate school. Yeah. Um, we have a student this year, Joshua Ramet, who um, has been accepted to 10 first grade graduate schools. In fact, he is right now interviewing at um, Caltech. Wow. Um, I think his top choices are Caltech and MIT. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, we're pretty good at getting students into um, the graduate programs. You know, and, and you talked about wonder earlier, and I thought that was a very interesting conversation. And 
you know, to me, that's something that I've always had a relationship with, with science, is that even as somebody who isn't focused on it, it's always been beautiful. So I want to ask you specifically, what is it that you find beautiful about physics? You know, maybe as a, as a last question, just mm -hmm. kind of just give us a brief overview about what made you so passionate about this issue. Well, not this issue, excuse me, this field of study. Well, I mean, I've done science for, um, for more than 40 years. Mm -hmm. I was a professional particle physicist um, for nearly a decade before coming to Hillstone College. Yeah. And I maintained a connection uh, with the particle data group for 34 years, um, where we summarized all the results in particle physics and published uh, a review called the Review of Particle Physics every two years. The most recent one just came out. Um, and what I really want to share, the most significant thing for me uh, to share with the students is how that decades of study of the physical universe has enhanced my, my sense of wonder about life mm -hmm. and about my own life. Um, uh, you, you can find wonder at many different scales. You can find wonder in the scale of this room, a butterfly, yourself. Mm -hmm. um, you can find the scale of wonder at the level of an atom. You study the quantum mechanics of it, and you understand, and you and you get to see just how strange the universe operates at the level of uh, an angstrom, or smaller in size. It's just it believe it behaves in an unbelievably strange way. And it was our goal of Science 101, mm -hmm. the physics part of Science 101, to um, take one aspect of that called the wave particle duality of quantum mechanics and teach the students enough about it that maybe they could grasp that wonder. And what we discovered in, the, in the 18 years of trying is that, yes, you could succeed with some fraction of students, but not a very large fraction. Yeah. But if you look at the large-scale structure of the universe, just how vast it is and how much stuff is in the universe and how old it is, those things, a much larger fraction of the students are able to just innately perceive the wonder in it. Mm -hmm. And our, the rate of discovery is just phenomenal. For example, it was now three years ago in November that um, by studying the extrasolar planets that have been detected in the last couple of decades around other stars, there's been an avalanche of them in the last few years, it was measured that 22% um, of sun-like stars have Earth-like planets in the habitable zone. 22% mm -hmm. of sun-like stars have Earth-like planets in the habitable zone. Earth-like meaning between half the diameter and twice the diameter of Earth. Mm -hmm. In the habitable zone meaning that water could be liquid somewhere on the surface of the planet. And well, there's like 200 billion sun-like stars in the Milky Way galaxy, and so 22% is about, what, a fifth, 40 billion Earth-like planets in the habitable zone in the Milky Way galaxy. Now, that is a wondrous thing. Mm -hmm. And humanity's only known that number for about three years. People have speculated on it for a longer time, but mm -hmm. it has only become a measured thing in the last few years. And if you reflect on that number, I think it leaves me absolutely dumbstruck. Mm -hmm. And it's not a difficult number to convey to people and to understand the physics of how that was measured. That's also not difficult to convey. And you hope that when a student learns how it's done and listens to the to the number and thinks about it, that they're absolutely dumbstruck too with wonder at mm -hmm. this universe. There's, there's an example. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm sad to say, but that's all the time we have. I mean, this has been a very fascinating conversation. Thank you again for taking the time. It's really been my pleasure. Boy, that time went by, and I'm sorry for hogging the conversation. Hey, no worries. It was it was it was wonderful. Uh, thank you for listening and watching. After Office Hours, presented by the Hillsdale Collegian, I've been Shadrach Straley. Go ahead and check out the Collegian website for more news and more video, as well as our YouTube channel and our social media outlets. We hope we can provide more content for you like this in the future. Like Once again, I've been Shadrach Straley, and thank you very much, Dr. Hayes.
Thank you.